So I'm going to do the first part, and Hal's going to do the second part. And when we were sort of discussing it, we could speak for about 18 hours on this. So we picked a few things that sort of turned our own individual cranks. So my bits, essentially, I'm going to talk about a little bit about follow-up and is it worthwhile or not. M more importantly than segueing into if you do do follow-up and you do do CA125, does that actually help anybody? And then a completely unknown question that is coming for Helen to talk about in 5, 10, and 15 years is uh, repeat surgery in the relapsed field. Anyway, so... That's, and then Hal's going to talk, to, uh, his interesting type of things are, when we're looking at platinum resistance and sensitive, he's then going to want to talk to about how long should you go on with your chemotherapy for? Should you do it in short, sharp bursts or go on or stop? And then also a little bit about uh, additional therapy, maintenance therapy or continuing on with some of the new slightly more targeted type therapies, so the PARP inhibitors, the VEGF inhibitors. Uh, my disclosures are actually exactly the same of Hal's. It's nothing relevant to these talks, but we have done lots of things with lots of pharmaceutical companies. And that's Hal's. And here's the learning objectives I just went through. Now, this is just to tech check that your uh, audience thingamies, whatever those little things you control are. Oh. <laughs> That's an organ grinder, and that's a monkey. And just to see if it works, I want you to say the monkey is either Herte, Hoskins, or, if you like, we can also put in Mackay now. And I know what the answer should be if I put in Helen. Um, so if, if you just quickly answer just to show that it's working. Okay, no. Oh. Okay, four, uh, once we get to 20, then that's going to be a... And my betting is that I'm the monkey, but we'll see. Okay, if we can just sort of see. Oh, hang on, I probably have to press something. Yeah, true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I love you all, too. <laughs> and I'm not allowed to be rude. I'm on my best behavior today, so I'm going to bite my lips. Okay, so just... A lot of what we talk about when, we, uh, when your cancers come back is this sort of sensitive, resistant divide. And it's semi-helpful. It just gives us an idea that you're more likely to benefit, you're less likely to benefit. It's not a God-given rule, because actually if it was, suddenly, how do cancers know that six months matters? They don't have watches, as far as I'm aware. They obviously have some circadian rhythms, presumably. So this basically is, and all of these definitions were really based on clinical progression. So either you were doing imaging or you had sort of symptoms. It wasn't based on CA125, because as I'll show you later, CA125 goes up three, four, five months before you get clinical imaging sort of signs of things. So in a way, when we apply old information to today's situation, we're getting it wrong from the very start. But all we're trying to say is that really the only thing that's truly bad is to be refractory to a drug. And if you're refractory to first-line chemotherapy, so your cancer grows during some time, even by about cycle four or five, unfortunately the ultimate survival in that situation is very poor. And actually, even though it's a very difficult thing to do, and we all tend to give a second treatment because we're worried it's desperate, sometimes it might be smarter in that situation to stop and move over to purely symptom management. Moving on, then you've got resistant, and that really comes, your cancers come back within six months, and then sensitive, <coughs> more than six months, and then you have sort of a little bit sensitive and super sensitive, which is the sort of six to 12 months and the 12 months difference. And it only really matters in terms of it's telling you what the chances of you benefiting later are. Nothing says that you won't benefit, apart from perhaps the refra truly refractory state. But once you get into your cancer shrunk down somewhat, but then come back, you have a chance of responding. And remember, response, again, is a purely artificial doctor construct that says you've had a, in the old days, when Hannah, Hal and I are from, a 50% shrinkage in size. And as I always say, so a 30% shrinkage in size is chopped liver. So you just have a greater degree of benefiting or not, depending on what goes on. But we use these constructs really to tell us what chemotherapies to use in these sort of situations. And the unfortunate truth is when your ovarian cancer comes back apart and 
this is going to be predominantly serious, really you're unlikely, if ever, to be cured. We've all got occasional people who actually have, but it's anecdotal, so I can remember two or three people in my somewhat long career now. So what are our goals when your cancer comes back? Well, it's palliative in intent. And to be honest, when we're not, so you shouldn't be saying, I'm going to cure you. We should be honest with your patient group. What, so what we want to do really is a couple of things. We want to make you live as long as we possibly can, but we also want to keep the quality of life up during that time so you can actually live and do, be a family member, be a worker, enjoy life. We very much want to manage your symptoms, and two things cause symptoms, and I want you to remember, cancer causes symptoms and Dr. Herte causes symptoms. <laughs> the response to treatment is to delay the progression, essentially. And you, as it says on there, you must balance your benefits and improvements in symptoms versus the side effects. And that's really all important. So really, this is my idea. This is how my very simplistic brain type, thinks about type things. So when I see somebody whose cancer's come back, the first step is to straight away manage the symptoms while I'm taking 14 weeks to think about things because I'm not a surgeon, so I can't make quick de decisions. And then if I decide I want to treat you, I'm going to treat you now or later. And if I decide that I shouldn't treat you because the chance of my benefiting you is so small and the chance of my giving you side effects and toxicity is so high that I actually should move over to symptom management, quality of life, end of life care, that's the sort of second step, really, is to decide to treat or not to treat. And then when you decide to treat, you can either treat now or you can treat later. So again, my own personal philosophy is if the person I'm looking after ha is asymptomatic and can cope with me doing nothing for a time apart from more intensive follow-up, it's far better not to do anything. But stressing that I am going to do something later. And then if you've got... If, and when you are going to do something, if your disease is in one or two places, then I'd actually actually look for localized treatment, which could be a radiation and it could be surgery. If it's widespread in many places, then I know we can't radiate it. And I, as I'll show you later on, all the surgical studies are going for people with relatively limited disease. So, a uh, quick audience question, I think. So follow-up is useful, yes or no. You have to be dogmatic, one side or other. There's no perhapses, okay? And it's just trying to make a point. Okay, if we can see it, and then we'll see the answer. Okay, all right. So 70% think yes, 30% no. So when I was younger, I was in the red group. I was very dogmatic. I knew even more then than I know now. I've changed because the voice that's missing in a lot of this stuff is the patient voice. Oh, that shouldn't be there. Let's leave, leave that one out. Okay, so what are the, what are the value to follow up? And before I get into C125. So the patient voice is reassurance and peace of mind. And we were hearing that this morning that the worst time in a person's life is when they finish their first line chemotherapy and they're working way, you know, their head. They've got their head up a little bit and they're waiting for somebody to kick it in as their cancer comes back. So actually that doing nothing in that period is very, 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 very difficult um, for patients up front. It's the right thing to do unless we come across a maintenance therapy that significantly prolongs your progression-free survival at low toxicity, in which case we can do things. And I think we are moving towards that now. The studies are ongoing. A patient coming to see me in the clinic, they get continuity, and as we heard this morning, they actually like to see the consultant, not necessarily the resident or the fellow so much. Patients really do like continuity. They do like having ability to, uh, contact with the cancer center rather than their GPs. And in fact, the other, and I haven't put it on here, is they do like to have tests done. Um, so a test could be a history and a physical but they like to have something done. So more and more CA125 is part of the thing. Now, again, it's not necessarily the right thing to do, but for a lot of patients, actually, I, I can even sell it to myself now, that you do a CA125 because if it's normal, the person will go away and only get upset a week before they see me again. They get peace of mind. They can go away. Their quality of psychological life is better. 
obviously detect the, manage the complications of treatment, both physical and, as we heard this morning, psychosocial. So they're not getting back to work, they're upset, their family's not doing so well. So again, we can actually maybe picking people for counseling, picking up people with side effects. Though most of the side effects I cause, I actually can't make better. Um, they get better in their own time or they don't. And then the really important thing that comes up is, can we detect early recurrence? And does this actually matter? And that really means that I'm going to do something quickly. So do you live longer as a result of my detecting your recurrence early? Absolutely not. Do I maintain your quality of life longer by detecting your early recurrence when you're asymptomatic and treating you? Absolutely not. Would it allow for a successful attempt at surgical removal? Yeah, maybe. That's where the studies are going. But then is, that just, is this a biologically different disease from the people we'll be looking at later? And it's uh, a window of opportunity to try experimental approaches. So you could actually treat use CA125 as a marker for experimental treatments. And if it starts to come down, then maybe you've got something interesting to take into bigger studies. So here's the first scenario. 64-year-old, <coughs> grade 3 serous, BRCA wild type, CA125 380 preoperative. We, so know that we know the CA125 is a useful marker. Uh, nicely debulked, six cycles of any flavor of carbotaxel you wanted to give. Two years later, they're asymptomatic, but their CA125 has gone up to 80. So the question is, now what? So this is the question for you. And now you can have some wiggle room, but yes, no, or perhaps. I preferably don't use perhaps, because that's but one of the two. OK. So let's see. OK. I can sit down now. Hal, it's your turn. So most people actually don't think you should treat asymptomatic CA125 relapse, and absolutely. So a little bit of background information about CA125 for you. CA125 is a cancer tumor marker, but other things other than cancer make it go up, and everybody has some in their bloodstream anyway. That's why we have a normal range. And so when you're following CA125, if that's what you're doing, in your follow-up, Yes, it could be your ovarian cancer that's come back. Yes, it could be another cancer, but that's getting vanishingly rare, and I'm not of the school who rebiopsies everything when it comes back. If it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, and looks like a duck, it probably is a duck. But inflammation, well, surgery they won't have had, but inflammation, so pleural, peritoneal, pericardial, uh, some form of pelvic inflammatory disease or whatever, congestive cardiac failure, and some degree of liver failure. So just remember, there are other causes of the CA125 going up. And where is, why is that relevant? So this is uh, various studies, mainly from Gordon Ruston out of uh, North London. And he's looked at CA125 in patients in follow-up. And he's looked at it, what it means. And he came down to a variety of type of things. So if, if your CA125 normalizes with your primary treatment, then if it goes up to two times the upper limit of normal, so it might be 25, 26, 35 put, times 2, What's the chance that that really means you've got cancer present? Well, the false positive rate for all of these things, and two times the nadir, which is where it has never gone down, say it's 40, and it's now gone up to 80, or 70, and it's gone up to 140. The false positive rate, so the chance that it's actually not truly cancer is one in 100. So really, by that time, yes, it is going to be cancer. Could possibly not but not often. False negative, so, a norm, so if you see somebody and their CA125 hasn't <coughs> gone up and they've got sort of symptoms or you do a scan, the lower figure is the more the one to look at because these are all retrospective studies where the data wasn't collected well. And then sometimes they're only having the CA125 done after the testing, but somewhere but 10% or less of women will actually have a false negative, so they will have cancer that's back the marker will be normal. Now, this is obviously not going to be the asymptomatic person because they're not looking, but this is the symptomatic person with a normal marker. It could be cancer just because the marker's normal. Doesn't mean they haven't, so you actually have to, well, do a history and physical is always useful, I suppose, but do a scan as well. And then this is just a, sort of an interesting more for sort of fellows and stuff in the audience. And this is a vanishingly rare scenario. So you can see 22 patients and 52 patients in two of the studies that are out there. 
And actually, sometimes the CA125 goes up very slowly within the normal range. Vanishingly rare, hardly ever see it. Normally, it's gone up within a month or so. But two sort of situations where there was enough data, they got a couple of values going up. And essentially, what I would uh, bring attention to is on the Santaland study, if it goes up by 10 units, so it's, say it was 5 and it's gone to 15, 18 out of those 19 people, the cancer was back. Not that you needed to do anything about it, but it's just, in a way, it's an early warning signal. Maybe you should follow these people a bit sooner. Patients are all, well, my patients, are all tracking their CA125. They can go onto the uh, record sort of sites, and they're interested. They always ask me, it's gone up by one point or two points. Does this mean my cancer's back? So the answer is no. But when it's gone up by that, then you say, prob you know, po probably I'm going to follow you a bit more often. Let me know if you have symptoms. And Levy's did a sort of similar type of thing and various different type of things. And at the bottom, you can see a signal, which was with, if your level was above 10, then you had to sort of go to uh, 20. And if your level was below 10, it was a doubling of the nadia. So again, just a pointer that something's happening, not that you need to do anything about it. Does de early detection make you live longer? No, it doesn't. And why is that? And actually, simplistically for me, I work it out in my brain by the fact that what kills you is resistant cancer. So that means I give you chemotherapy, the cancer sees it, you damage the DNA, whatever we do, and then it repairs the damage. Those cells I can never kill at any time, in any amount, and anywhere in your body. So that's ultimately what's going to kill you. The sensitive cells that I can still kill, I can kill at any time, in any amount, anywhere in your body, because cancers have to have blood vessels. Chemotherapy goes into your bloodstream, goes everywhere, apart from into your brain, perhaps. But anyway, so I think philosophically, it makes sort of sense. If you think, why do people fail treatment? It's not because we don't give them enough uh, chemotherapy and using Hel Helen's pictures of the elephant in the room. Giving chemotherapy is like treating with an elephant. We're giving huge amounts, and it's the biology that matters. And then finally, if you do want to do tests in follow-up, and for the most part, I used to be a, I don't want to do follow-up, I don't want to do markers now as I've got older and wiser. I do do follow-up and I do do markers. If it, I do markers, I do not do routine imaging because the false positive rates there are so high and then you go down a whole rabbit hole or wormhole. So is there any evidence that truly says that early treatment's better than later treatment? Well, there's the Rustin study, uh, essentially out of Europe, and this was Basically, women had had their primary treatment, their CA125 had been a marker and was now normal. And they got randomized up front, and the randomization was that your CA125 will be checked. When it goes up and meets the rust in li limits, half of the patients, the doctor will be told, and as a result, they'll panic and give you chemotherapy. In the other half, you won't be told. The doctor won't be told, so you'll just continue on with observation, and then you'll get chemotherapy later on. So really, it was a test of earlier and later chemotherapy. But everybody got chemotherapy. Oops, sorry, let me just go back. I don't know how I go back. Um, and as you can see, the survivals, when you look at the median two years or four years, absolutely not a hair's difference between them. Interesting, if you look at the quality of life, so falling quality of life is regarded as bad. So when I gave you early chemotherapy, you're, well, sorry, the people in England gave you early chemotherapy, you did what, your quality of life fell sooner. So chemotherapy adversely impacted your quality of life in these people who are essentially asymptomatic. And if you look at the other way around, who had maintained quality of life, which is what matters to patients, it was those who weren't being given chemotherapy before they needed it. Here's the survival curves, and they look fairly overlapping to me. So to go back a little bit, so the asymptomatic marker, oh, I can't even spell increase, but there we go. Um, so what would I do? So basically, I look at the CA125, and if it's meeting rusting criteria, so two times the nadir or two times the upper limit of normal, I actually will do a CT scan, but it's like doing various things. You can do fast CT scans or you can do slow CT scans. So it's probably four to eight weeks later because you don't want to do the CT scan too quickly in case there's nothing to see. So um, 
Um, so I tend to sort of look at four to eight weeks time to do the CT to give things a little bit more time to become clear. If the CEA125 has gone up less than that, most likely it's cancer, but not guaranteed. What I'll do is I'll repeat your CA125 in probably one and two months and review again and see where we're at. And then I do the scan and then we get back into that paradigm we saw before of localized leads to localized treatment, widespread leads to widespread treatment when you need it. Um, so here's a quick scenario. So she's now symptomatic. A year later, she's symptomatic. So now what? And so your final question, would you do debulking surgery? So she's now about three years out, otherwise pretty well. So you've got yes, no, or perhaps. So this is repeat attempt at re removing all of the cancer. And I'm just waiting for a few more responses. We're up to, blimey, 41. So see what, okay. So there is no evidence to say it's the right thing to do as yet. There are ongoing studies, but interestingly, one third of our audience would, and in fact, the no group is really quite small. So actually our, our surgeons in the audience are uh, ahead of the game. So what is the role of repeat debulking? So basically, and I actually went and read, tried to read as much of this stuff as possible. There's only about 8,000 papers on it. Um, so this is just three of the more modern studies. And it, essentially what I'm just trying to show you here, there's two things that predict how well you do after your cancers come back. One, there's the underlying biology of your disease, and that's your platinum sensitive, how long it took to come back, your CA125 level, whether you were optimally developed up front. But then also in this, as you can see, relapse surgery did come out in a multivariate analysis. So there's a hint, but, but it's not dogmatic, that actually doing that surgery is better. But also surgeons are very smart. They don't tend to operate on sick, ill people with bad disease. So is relapse surgery just another marker for surgeons being very smart, unlike medical oncologists. This is the overall survival data, and so the, the holy grail of where the surgeons are going is getting down to the residual zero, so essentially it's microscopic or no residual, because as you can see there, the difference between those with any degree of residual, and that could be millimeters, to those who you can't see any residual is a very large difference. Now again, it's not gonna say that there isn't actually something that benefits the people who got more residual, but it, that's just unknown. But the residual negative is where be, people have been running with. And then there's uh, the bottom one by Al Ruahari was just a Cochrane database review, again, showing that there was a quite a significant reduction in uh, outcomes as your amount of cancer increased. So the, the most interesting studies in then all of this, looking at the, the the surgery thing of the desktop series from Germany and Austria. So desktop one was just a retrospective looking at those patients who they decided they could operate on. And then they found out because residual negative is what they wanted to get to and could they identify who they could get those to residual negative. And three things came up. You could run marathons. You had a residual negative at your first operation. So the biology of the disease allowed you to be made residual negative up front. Now, and this is in with German and Austrian surgeons, so they may be more aggressive. So again, in the Canadian market, I'm not quite sure how much it fits. Or that you're stage one or two. So again, there's some sort of biological things in here and minimal ascites. And then in their original desktop one series, 79% of them could be optimally debulked to R0. Then they did desktop two, which was where they applied this going forward and to see if they could achieve, re replicate that in a non-randomized way. And as you can see, 76% of the time in first recurrence, this did predict that ability to get down to residual uh, negative. And actually in, in a, a later recurrence, it did this very similar. So, so we can pick out those who we can get to residual zero and relatively accurately now. The contra to this is you shouldn't be really, op what they're saying from all of this is that you shouldn't really at the moment be operating on all the other patients. Though again, 
there, there may be some degree of benefit, but that's not where they've gone. So there are now three ongoing phase three studies which are looking at the question of surgery and chemotherapy versus just chemotherapy on its own in the recurrent disease. Now, it's all in the platinum-sensitive people, so your cancer's taken six months or longer to come back. They all have a good performance status, essentially. And in every case, the surgeon thinks they're resectable. So again, there's some degree of surgical bias that's being put in here, but they think you're resectable. And so their desktop three in their GOG213, which is a slightly more inclusive sort of group, and I'm not really quite sure what a CR up front was, and then the SOCUS study out of Holland. But looking at the same group of patients, these studies are ongoing. Um, there aren't any results as yet, but they will be coming sort of relatively soon. And then it will be interesting. And then we'll be able to answer the question, is repeat operation in this selected group of patients worthwhile? And I think that's now Hal's turn. All right. Well, first of all, thank you for, for voting the way you did, because it was, it was a very interesting experience preparing this talk, because uh, while I was um, playing with my organ in Hamilton, I had to deal with a monkey in Vancouver. So <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, let's talk about uh, um, chemotherapy in, in recurrent disease. So uh, you've already heard Paul uh, define, you know, what, what we did, what we describe as platinum sensitivity. So the question then is, what what is the optimal chemotherapy in that situation? When should it start, and and for how long should we give it? So uh, the things that we have to consider is, you know, how long has the interval from previous therapy been? Uh, what kind of residual toxicities do the patients have from their their previous therapy? What's their performance status? Uh, what's the volume of disease they have at the time of rela relapse? Paul's already talked about serologic relapse and what we should do about that. And also, you know, we have to include the patient in these discussions. So what, what is the patient's wish for further therapy and what are their expectations? So how do we treat th choose the treatment? So if we're going to treat, uh, certainly you want to choose the most efficacious treatment. But in fact, in many situations, there isn't a lot to choose between efficacy. And, and then we have to say, well, which of these might be less toxic? Uh, is one, one, one agent easier to administer? Can it be given orally or inter rather than intravenously? Can we give it once every several weeks rather than weekly? And then also consideration of cost is an issue particular with our uh, healthcare providers. So in platinum sensitive disease, there are, there are four pivotal studies that I've, I've, I've put into this table here. Um, so these, the, the ICON-4 study looked at the doublet of carboplatinum and paclitaxel versus carboplatinum in first recurrence, and it showed both a, a, an improvement in progression-free survival as well as overall survival. But as you can imagine, uh, the combination, uh, at the addition of the paclitaxel, did result in more toxicity. Uh, the uh, the AGO OVAR uh, study, and that this was the uh, the ICON. Um, 15 study uh, that we did here in Canada. So that compared, compared the carboplatinum gemcitabine doublet with carboplatinum alone. Um, and it did show, uh, as well showed an increase in, in uh, progression-free survival. It wasn't powered for overall survival and, and, and in fact did not show an overall survival difference. And again, the, the doublet was more toxic than, 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 than the uh, single-agent carboplatinum. Uh, the Calypso study compared two doublets, so really seeing was one doublet better than the other. And although it showed a a very modest progression-free survival improvement uh, compared to the paclitaxel doublet. It showed no overall survival benefit. And as you might expect, there, was, there were differences in toxicities. The, the PLDRM obviously would, would give you more problems with hand-foot syndrome, and the, the paclitaxel are more issues with, uh, with uh, neuropathy. And the, the last study I'm going to talk a little bit more in about in a moment is adding, um, the, it's the OCEAN study, the adding bevacizumab to the uh, carboplatinum gemcitabine doublet. Um, so in, in terms of what, what should you take away from that? Well, certainly doublet chemotherapy is more effective than single-agent carboplatinum. 
Are any of these other, is one doublet more effective than the other? It's really hard to say. Certainly the PLD was perhaps marginally better than the, the Packley Taxol doublet. Uh, but I think all in all, I think you're going to have to decide which doublet you're going to go forward with based on the, the patient's previous toxicity. Uh, so those are all, I think, reasonable options. And then so how long should we, we treat patients with recurrent disease? So unfortunately, most patients uh, will not uh, achieve a complete remission. In the platinum sensitive group, it's only about six to 15%. In the platinum resistant group, it's only two to 3%. So the majority of patients will have residual disease if you, if you, if you reassess after six cycles of therapy. So what do we do? Should we continue with the, the same chemotherapy if the patient's asymptomatic? Should we stop after maximum response? In other words, give them a drug holiday <coughs> if, the, if the patient's asymptomatic, or should we switch to another chemotherapy? So what's the answer? Well, there are, in, in, it's certainly in recurrent disease, there are no uh, randomized uh, trials to address this. So in, in previously untreated patients, um, and, and this was done in the CAP area, so, uh, CAP area, so that was cyclophosphamide, adria, cisplatinum. There are, there are a number of trials that were comparing shorter versus longer chemotherapy, 6 versus 9 or 12, 5 versus 10, and, and I've, I've uh, referenced two of those at the bottom there. But none of those showed any evidence of, uh, of improvement in uh, progression or overall survival. In fact, in many of these studies, the patients randomized to the longer arm either had too much toxicity and didn't complete the therapy or, or stopped early. Uh, in recurrent disease, we don't have those kind of trials, but I think given that this is a more drug-resistant situation, it's not a large leap of faith to say that we're really going to see a similar trend. There are no randomized studies looking at uh, carboplatinum or cisplatinum and Paclitaxel combinations in this situation. So currently, uh, you know, the, the issue is a, is a personal choice between you and, and the patient, so toxicity is key. Uh, some patients will continue to choose to continue to, 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 to have further therapy as long as there's evidence that they're not in a remission, and I call that psychochemotherapy. I'm not sure that you're really uh, prolonging overall survival or, or progression-free survival. And I think you do have to consider uh, giving patients drug holidays. I think that's going to make a big issue in terms of uh, a big difference in terms of bone marrow reserve and what you're going to be able to give them down the road if they need more therapy, and, and also quality of life issues. You know, it's a bit like... Um, banging your head against the wall, um, you know, it feels a lot better once you stop. And, and it certainly they, when you stop the chemotherapy, although patients may feel reasonably well while they're on the chemotherapy, they'll often feel better once they've had a bit of a break. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about bevacizumab in the, in the platinum sensitive situation. Uh, so this, the, the pivotal study here is the OCEAN study. Uh, so this was, this was looking at patients with recurrent platinum sensitive disease and was really comparing the, uh, the carboplatinum gemcivine doublet and then adding bevacizumab during the chemotherapy for six cycles and, uh, and continuing that uh, uh, as a maintenance until progression. And the results here showed that in terms of progression-free survival, there was, a, there was a small improvement to just under, under four months of progression-free survival. With respect to overall survival, the initial analysis did show a, a, a benefit in terms of the, uh, the, the bevacizumab arm, but in the second interim analysis, that disappeared, so uh, no overall uh, benefit. This combination is approved by Health Canada for platinum-sensitive recurrence, but in fact, I, I don't know whether there are any jurisdictions in Canada that in, in, in which it's approved at this point in time. Appro and so approved in Alberta. Sorry? It's approved in Alberta. Alberta. Okay. Is that right? Okay. All right. Anybody else in any of the provinces? Is it, is it covered in the platinum sensitive situation? Certainly not in Ontario. No. All right, so the PARP inhibitors, um, so those, those clearly are going to play a role in the, the platinum resistance uh, situation. So there are three drugs that, uh, that we should talk about and uh, th three tri trials that, are, that have given pivotal results. So there's the NOVA study looking at niraparib. So this was a maintenance study looking at patients who've had at least two uh, prior platinum-based chemotherapies and, and their penultimate, their previous chemotherapy, they had to have at least a six-month interval before they progressed before their chemotherapy that they got that they were getting the maintenance niraparib for. And so they, they actually divided the patients into three groups, those that were BRCA positive, 
those that didn't have a BRCA mutation but had evidence of, based on a, uh, an assay, the My Choice HRD assay, that they had a homologous recombinant uh, deficiency, and then a, a group of patients who had neither of those. And so this was given as a maintenance as soon as they'd finished their uh, most recent chemotherapy and were, were continued on until progression. And as you can see, the, the group that benefited the most were the, the patients with, who had a, a germline BRCA mutation. They had a hazard ratio of 0.27. Uh, and the progression-free survival for the patients who had HRD was, was good as well, but not quite as good with a hazard ratio of 0.38. And then even the patients who had neither of those uh, benefited as well, and the hazard ratio was 0.45. It's too early. We don't have any survival data, uh, overall survival data, but the hope is that, um, you know, with results in progression-free survival like this, we'll hopefully see survival benefits uh, as well. So this, uh, based on these results, the, uh, the drug has been approved in the U.S., uh, end of March for, for all of these indications. I don't know what the price point is. Uh, and we're expecting the review in Canada uh, t for this drug. The, the drug is potentially going to be available by the end of the year in Canada as well. Uh, you've heard about the SOLO study. So this is looking at Olaparib. So the SOLO1 study is a maintenance study after first-line chemotherapy. The SOLO2 study is in patients who've had uh, two or more uh, uh, lines of, uh, of uh, platinum doublet chemotherapy. And, and the results of the SOLO2 study were, were uh, reported at the SGO. And so, in, in fact, it showed a, a significant improvement in progression-free survival. So the investigator-assessed analysis uh, hazard ratio of 0.3, so 19.1 versus 5.5 month median uh, progression-free survival. Um, and in the blinded independent review showed even, even more remarkable differences, 30.2 versus 5.5. Again, it's, it's too early. We don't have any survival, overall survival data, but the hope is that with those kind of progression-free survival differences that we'll hopefully see an overall survival benefit. The SOLO1 data, because that's actually a better group of patients, we're not going to have a result back for probably a, another year and a half, two years. And lastly, the, the, the Ariel 2 study, which is um, a third aid rucaparib, and this was a, an, an actually active treatment uh, design. So these patients have had at least first-line carboplatin and paclitaxel chemotherapy and progressed and then gotten this agent if they'd progressed six months or more beyond treatment. And uh, they were then divided up into to, to three arms, those who had a BRCA mutation, those who had what they call loss of heterozygosity, which uh, with, with they had an assay to really measure HRD again, and then those who had neither. Uh, there wasn't a control arm where, where none of these patients were treated. But as you can see, um, uh, you can see the top line there is the patients who were BRCA mutant. Those had the, the greatest benefit. Uh, and comparing that with the uh, patients who had neither of those uh, abnormalities, the, the hazard ratio is 0.27. Those who had evidence of uh, HRD but no, no BRCA mutation, uh, the hazard ratio was 0.62. And we don't have a, a control, so I, I can't tell you whether those patients who had neither of those things and, and got Rucapra, would they have done better uh, than a patient who got placebo? So we don't know that from, from, uh, from this trial design. But, but clearly, all three of these agents look like they have activity in, in platinum-resistant recurrent disease. So what are the principles of, of uh, treatment of patients in this situation? Well, you certainly can uh, retreat with the same or a similar regimen uh, using a carbo uh, carboplatinum doublet of either paclitaxel, liposomal doxorubicin, or gemcitabine. Uh, my, my own philosophy is to treat to maximum response or progression or unacceptable toxicity and then stop and watch them off therapy. You can certainly use these doublets as long as you've got a treatment-free interval at least six months or longer. The PARP inhibitors certainly look exciting, and, and hopefully we'll have access to those. Uh, but clearly, both uh, the, both of the maintenance studies are positive, uh, and it looks like the uh, the, the uh, active intervention with the rucaparib looks exciting as well. And the VEGF inhibitors, bevacizumab, show show modest prolongation of PFS, but no overall survival benefit when you combine those with chemo. So let's move on to for the last part to the treatment of platinum resistant disease. Uh, so we have a case here, a 47-year-old woman. She has a, a large ovarian mass with a mental caking. She has an elevated CA, CA 125 of just under 600. She has um, a BRCA1 mutation. She's treated with upfront debulking, but is left with miliary peritoneal metastases. She receives six cycles of carboplatinum paclitaxel chemotherapy and has normalization of her CA125 and her CT scan. 
She is feeling well, but has some residual grade two neuropathy in her hands and feet. And then three months after completing the chemotherapy, she develops a rising CA125, and a CT scan shows no new, new peritoneal nodularity. So you, you, uh, she's considered to have platinum resistant disease. And so your treatment options uh, uh, would be chemotherapy with either PLD, uh, PLD paclitaxel, topocatecan with or without bevacizumab, supportive care symptom control, consideration of a clinical trial. So which of those uh, would, you, uh, would you choose? Okay, fine. Yeah, so I, and th there aren't really any incorrect responses. Um, certainly any of those, 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 those are reasonable choices. And most patients wouldn't consider supportive care, but th there, there certainly are the patients who've said, look, I've had enough chemotherapy. I really just want my, my symptoms controlled. So um, I, I agree with those responses. So with respect to, to, to treatment of, uh, uh, of uh, recurrent ovarian cancer with chemo, we, we, are, we are really are left with a number of single agent treatment options. And you can see the, the list of the drugs that are commonly used. And um, in, in, in single, uh, single arm study, they've had response rates of anywhere from five to 20%. And I used to think that in fact, um, you know, they, they're really all fairly similar in terms of um, uh, their likelihood of benefit. But in fact, and n none of these really have been, uh, were, were, ha have been studied in situations where multiple agents are, are, are compared in the clinical trial. But in fact, there is a study that I'll, that I'll review with you briefly that, that does give us some, some clues about which agent might be the best. And again, I think the, how do you choose the treatment? Uh, again, it's gonna be efficacy, toxicity, ease of administration and cost. So in fact, the study that gives us a clue about you know, how these compare is the Aurelia study. And the question here was really, uh, was, bev was bevacizumab added to these beneficial? But in fact, the control arm, there were three different options that could be chosen, uh, weekly paclitaxel, topotecan, or liposomal doxorubicin. And although this wasn't randomized, each of those cohorts needed to be filled. So, um, so although there are caveats in terms of it not being randomized, I think it does give us clues in terms of how these agents actually compare. And so in the original um, publication, they, they lumped all of those arms together, but in a letter in the JCO um, uh, by Poveda, he actually broke down responses uh, according to the different arms, and I think that's very informative. So let me just show you. So those, there are the three arms, the Paclitaxel, PLD, and Topotecan. And so if you look at uh, progression-free survival, Paclitaxel came out a little better than the PLD and, and Topotecan, so 3.9, 3.5, and 2.1 uh, uh, median survival in months. But in terms of overall response rates, uh, Paclitaxel certainly came out way on top, uh, almost 30% response rate, PLD a, a distant second, and Topotecan really dragging across the bottom. Uh, and so what was the effect of adding Bevacizumab to this? Well. It, it, it made bad chemotherapy better, essentially. So, so the, the paclitaxel, again, was the best arm, 50% response rates. The PLT and topotecan were about 20% um, response rates. So using, using these data, you know, my, my preference is generally to use the weekly paclitaxel in a situation. If a patient doesn't have a lot of residual neuropathy, I think it's clearly, clearly the best drug in this situation. Um, so how can we improve outcomes in a situation? Well, there's no evidence that giving combinations of cytotoxic agent uh, is superior to using single agents. We don't have any r randomized studies that show that the in vitro sensitivity assays can predict those patients who uh, will improve or, or have benefit from getting one agent over the other, so it is quite empirical. Um, the targeted agents, bevacizumab, you, you've seen sh improve overall pr progression-free survival, but, but not overall survival. The PARP inhibitors, we don't know how well they work in this situation. There's obviously interest if they're working in platinum sensitive disease, will we see benefit in this group of patients, but we don't have any data there yet. Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna spend a great deal of time talking about hormonal therapy. There, there actually is a randomized study that was just published by the, uh, the Nordic group looking at uh, patients with platinum um, uh, resistant recurrence comparing weekly paclitaxel or PLD with tamoxifen, the usual 40 milligrams a day dose, and chemotherapy was better uh, than tamoxifen, uh, uh, 
12 versus eight weeks of, uh, of uh, progression-free survival, but obviously the chemotherapy was more toxic. And we don't have a control arm, so we don't really know was the tamoxifen any better than, than control. Um, uh, so we've, uh, we've already, I think we've done this question here. I'm just going to skip over that. Um, so recommendations for recurrent disease. So we do have numerous options available. I think we have to consider patients, um, patient characteristics, their patient, patient preference. We all, as Paul's already said, toxicity is a, a major issue. We really have to make sure that we're not giving them cumulative toxicity. Um, palliation can be achieved, however, long-term long survival is, is really not one of the things that we've achieved yet. And I think wherever possible, we need to have uh, patients uh, uh, and enter clinical trials. So I'm going to stop there and uh, answer any questions you have. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Paul, do you want to come up as well, in case they want to ask you questions as well? Uh, the one question I do have is, let's say you have a patient who is platinum resist resistant on carboplatin. Would you consider cisplatin, and what are your thoughts? I think cisplatinum and carboplatinum are exactly the same drug, but one's a less toxic variant and more convenient. And there's 1,800 or seven randomized trials in the upfront situation, whatever it is, showing that cis and carbo are the same. So I only ever use cisplatinum if somebody has carboplatinum allergy, which does become a problem in the recurrent situation because it's not an upfront thing like Taxol it's a delayed um, effect. And so after eight or nine or 10 cycles, I think we're getting up to a 30% rate of carbo allergies. And, you know, the, and the other issue that's sometimes raised is if you delay the time that you use platinum again by using non-platinum agents, can you actually make a patient more sensitive to the platinum down the road? And I think there, there actually isn't any evidence that that's the case. So I think once a patient is platinum resistant, then delaying uh, using that down the road again by using non-platinum agents probably isn't an effective strategy. Thank you. The only one thing I would actually take exception to Hal in his talk was platinum resistant doesn't mean platinum refractory. Mm -hmm. So if you've progressed on platinum, I'll never give you platinum again. But if you're platinum resistant, I'll give you platinum again. I may choose to give it later after calyx or whatever, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean it's not going to work. It's just a lesser chance to work. And actually, the response rates are in the same 10, 15% ballpark. So platinum's still there in the menu for the fellows and stuff for platinum resistant because it's just an artificial construct saying likelihood of response, not no response. Um, so I just wanted to ask two questions, actually. The first one, um, say a patient has bevacizumab in the frontline setting. When they recur, um, and I know for most jurisdictions it's only funded uh, once in a lifetime, but if they say they want to pay, what type of conversation do you have about reusing bevacizumab? And just the second one is, um, aside from trials which should be offered at every stage of the patient journey, how many lines of chemotherapy? Yeah, so in terms of the BEV question, I don't have any data to support using it again if, if they've recurred. I don't, think, I don't think we have any evidence to tell us that it is effective, but I don't. I, um, and um, uh, in terms of lines of chemotherapy, I think it's about performance status. And, uh, you know, again, I, if, if you have a clinical trial available, I'd prefer to put those on. But I think if somebody's well enough and, and doesn't have... Uh, get, getting toxicities from treatment... I, I, we have some patients who, you know, they're the, the ones that surely you respond, so you'll, you'll, you'll be fifth or sixth line and they seem to respond to whatever you do. The, the ones who don't respond, unfortunately, they don't get the opportunity to have that many lines of therapy. So, you know, there is the odd patient who, you know, you go out to sixth, seventh, and eighth line. There are not many, but some of, it, it is sometimes worthwhile to do that. So the average in the BCCA, so the BC <coughs> system, is five to six lines of therapy. Now, you're seeing people like me, and I'm very aggressive at keep on giving chemo, but we're selecting out, so, and yes, there are the BRCA pe positive people or the what, DNA repair people who keep on responding. Yeah. And, it, and if the patient has the will, I think, and they think it's worthwhile and the chance of benefiting, then actually I, I will give chemotherapy for long periods of time, but obviously with diminishing benefit, increasing toxicity as time goes on. So you actually have to have the, co 
conversation of is this worthwhile for you? Going into the side effects, potential benefits, does this fit with your needs? And patients actually quite often have to get five, six sets of treatment to say, no more, I'm done. Right. Thank you for that awesome talk. I would like to have your opinion regarding chemotherapy following complete secondary cytoreductive surgery. <laughs> well, given that I can't say that complete secondary cytoreductive surgery is the right thing to do, but I hope it's going to actually show that it is, because actually I don't, I'm, unless the surgeons are aware of any randomized data in the upfront situation, it would help me extrapolate to the upfront. Um, I would say yes, because a surgeon can only remove what they can see. So I think after complete debulking, you will need chemo. Will you need chemotherapy straight away? Because the surgeon's done what I can achieve with chemotherapy over four months, and you've done it in a three-hour operation with a six-week turnaround. I'd be quite happy, given I can't cure that person, that you've made them better to wait and then give them chemotherapy when they truly needed it. So do I feel a need that I have to give chemotherapy straight away? No. Chemotherapy sometime? Yes. So, I agree. It's certainly in the platinum sensitive situation, in a platinum resistant situation, I'm not sure I'd be too keen to do more chemo, but in the platinum sensitive situation, certainly. So I have a question. So with the, with the PARP inhibitors, I mean, we're, we're, we're waiting for the overall survival data, and I'm hopeful, like you both are, that we have wonderful results and we know the answer. But it is not unreasonable to think that we're just going to have a progression-free survival advantage and no overall survival advantage again. So how do we make this decision when you have all these other agents, you know, pisoponib, exabepilone, even weekly taxol that showed PFS but no overall survival advantage and yet we don't do those? How do you make that decision for what? And is it completely based on side effects? Well, and it's certainly, yeah, and cost as well. I mean, and these, these are They're not all expensive. Be, these are not, and these are really expensive. Yeah. Uh, but you're certainly in terms, the nice thing about the PARP inhibitors is we don't have a sense, as opposed to chemotherapy, where you have a lot of cumulative toxicity. It's, it's, it's less going to be less of an issue, although we are still waiting to, to learn about the long-term issues of being on a PARP inhibitor and second malignancy. Right. But that doesn't look like that's playing out. So I think if you can keep somebody well for, a you know, number of months and years uh, with so, an oral agent, I think that that's... So then if somebody the doesn't have toxicity to Taxol and it's relatively cheap, have you used maintenance Taxol for the progression-free survival advantage? I, I, I have done the same, though, with carboplatinum. If it's non-toxic and they're not getting reactions, then I'll make it up to six or eight weeks of every treatment. But to go back to the PARP inhibitors or a maintenance sort of style therapy and how would you do them, I always used to be very much into the overall survival was, en was everything, but more and more it's getting so complicated because everything else that we do subsequently becomes quite difficult to tell. But actually when you look at what patients want, the t and certainly in the upfront sort of situation of the first line, the, re the rationale for using maintenance is it's the most expensive way to use an expensive drug. So from a system point of view, it makes absolutely no sense. But from a patient point of view, you're likely to be at your best, most functioning, most able to do, either after first-line therapy or after platinum-sensitive recurrence. So I certainly, my experience with P-CODA is that overall survival really is the golden endpoint, but in more and more cancer types, if you can show significantly long benefit in progression-free survival. So 16 months is a long time of time to have to go to your children's graduations, weddings, blah, blah, blah. So I think actually it is worthwhile. The trouble is that the costs, it's just unaffordable. If everything costs the same as tamoxifen, we wouldn't even be having the conversation. Last question. Thank you. I'd just like to say, Alon, to, to your comment, it seems that the data with Olaparib seems to show secondary analysis over long term that there will be an overall survival benefit. So we, we can be optimistic about it. <laughs> So these two great gentlemen here. I want to reconcile. Did you say weird? <laughs> weird, weird. <laughs> what did you say? I said Good. great. I said great. Said <laughs> I want to reconcile, uh, Paul, your statement. You said that um, for patients asymptomatic in the platinum sensitive group, you know, you prefer not to treat. Um, you know, come back when your disease is coming out of your abdomen. 
Um, sorry, did I, you say I, that? Did you say I, that? I, you say I, that? No, I don't know. Anyway, like <laughs> let's get to the question. Let's get to the question. <laughs> but I, I, but I, how I do you reconcile? That point in moment. <laughs> how do you reconcile? If you'd like to get to the point. <laughs> <laughs> Reconcile that with the idea that um, people get five and six lines of therapy, as you, as you quite rightly said. So if part of your algorithm for decision to treat is, well, if you're well and you're symptomatic and prefer not to treat, where do the five lines fit in? And if you wait till patients are symptomatic or radiologically have more gross disease, we know from a lot of different reviews that their actual chance of response actually gets less um, in terms of higher resistant clones and so on. And, Elizabeth Eisenhower, when she did her review of all the responses to uh, phase two trials, um, the biggest things that people didn't respond to those that had disseminated disease, large volume disease, greater than five centimeters, et cetera, et cetera. So just reconcile for me the option not to do anything while we're treating with five lines and while we... I think it's watching yeah. closely, so I yeah. think, you know, and there are some patients who that rising marker drives them crazy. Are, are, there, are there patients who you, you say, well, you know, stop bothering me, we'll start so, but, so of ten, of 10 patients, you see how, within this category, how many would you not treat? I would say for virtually none, none of them. I, I, you know, but I would, uh, uh, they're having rising, so they, I, I tell they them that there is disease that's going to come back, and I think, you No, know, but the CT is positive. Well, the CT is positive, then I, then I would The CT treat. is positive, but low volume disease. Yeah. They no, got I, a, I they got a increasing lymph I, I node, treat, but they're asymptomatic. Yeah, I wouldn't, but certainly the issue, and there, the issue, I, 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 I'd like to ideally start you the day before your, your, your symptoms start, and that can be hard to predict, but you can get a sense of, you know, how quickly the marker's rising to say, you know, is this likely going to be several months or is it going to be a few weeks? And, and you know, the ones who, who are shorter, I think you really need to start earlier rather than later. Okay. Sorry, Preful, one last question. Oh, no, sorry. no, no, no. I, I, I think actually we, we do need to have this break. Maybe you can talk to Paul <laughs> and Hal. But, and but before but we do anything can else. I just, answer, Michael, uh, 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 just quick, quickly. So okay, you have 30 don't, seconds. We don't wait till the cancer's coming out of their abdomen. <laughs> <laughs> That's the trick is that you wait. <laughs> You wait, you, wait, no, you wait until they're marginally symptomatic, <laughs> and that's where the reason for doing the CT scan. If you've got micros you know, little, a little bits of stranding and stuff, I know you've got cancer. I'm not going to treat that. But if I think within two months you're going to be in bowel obstruction, I d that's even I give you chemotherapy straight away. Okay. And uh, to answer your other question, everything is biology. It's not size things. So big cancers that are widespread are bad boys. Little cancers that aren't widespread are slightly better. Thank you.